I think that students have inspired me as much as anything else. You know, a, a great book writer, uh, you know, a great author maybe inspires me less than somebody struggling with a really important story to themselves that they might want to tell. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Native Minnesota, a podcast about the Native American experience in Minnesota and beyond. I'm your host, Rebecca Crook Stratton. I'm Secretary Treasurer of the Shakopee Bidwakton Sioux Community. This podcast is a project of Understand Native Minnesota, a campaign focused on improving the narrative about Native Americans in Minnesota's K-12 schools. Today, I'm joined by Hyde Erdrich. Hyde is a writer, poet, editor, curator, and educator. She's also a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. In this episode, we talk about the common themes across Hyde's work, how she became an artist, and her experience teaching creative writing. She also gives advice to both educators and anyone who wants to find their creative voice. I hope you enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here today with Hyde Erdrich uh, for our podcast episode. Um, Hyde is multi-talented. Um, she is an artist. She's an educator. Um, she writes poetry, um, many, many different different skills and talents. And we are excited that you're here with us today to share a little bit about yourself and and some of the projects you're working on. So welcome, Hyde. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It's great to be here, especially on Indigenous Peoples Day. Yes, it is Indigenous Peoples Day today. Um, you want to share a little little bit about yourself and the work you do? Yeah, um, I'll introduce myself. Buju Anin Hyde Erdrich Indigenikaz Jaganashimong Majikwe Indigo Makwandodam. My name is Hyde, and I grew up in North Dakota. I'm a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe. Well, welcome. Um, so I think one of your most recent projects uh, was a book of poetry, the the Little Big Bully. Um, you you've written a few books of poetry. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe some common themes in your work and what inspires you to write? Yeah, you know my work has sort of a through line of looking at uh, indigenous knowledge, place. Uh, and connections to what we learn about as science and history in the overarching, um, you know, American education or the American conversation um, and, you know, pushing back against those things. But I also write often about Indigenous artwork and artists, and that's one of the things that has really inspired me. But the natural world, art, artists, those are the things um, that mostly come out in my writing. Was there something as like a young person that kind of took you down this path uh, to be a writer? Yeah, my my mom and dad were both teachers and they really valued creative work from all of us. I have seven siblings. We grew up in Wahpeton and my dad particularly loved poetry. He would give us books of poems and ask us to memorize them and recite them. We really had just two books of poems and those books he would hand to us. They were, you know, made in the 1920s. So they're a hundred years old now. And we would, you know, do that for entertainment. He didn't let us watch TV very much. It was North Dakota, small town. There wasn't a lot to do in the winter. So we thought poetry was a thing. <laughs> and so did you start writing as a, a young person then? Yeah, I started writing poetry probably in, I remember in the fifth grade, a poet in the schools came to talk to us. And I really just loved everything he said about how to, you know, push words into creative shapes and what metaphor was and simile and all sorts of, you know, tools of language. And immediately I caught on to that and wanted to learn about that and started writing poetry um, pretty early on. And I think I published my first poem when I was 16. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Um, I, I wish I had that creativity, but I just am not, um, not one for writing. But you you tackle some really big issues in your work. Um, your latest collection, The Little Big Bully, um, touched on the near extinction of bison, um, as well as the missing and murdered Indigenous women or people epidemic. Um, 
you know, why is creative writing and, and poetry in particular a useful way to address some of these issues that impact our people? Yeah, I think for me, I, I'm i able to get a fairly big audience of Native and non-Native people, and I can ask people to think about things in ways that maybe will like go into their brains um, as image, as um, you know, a musical way of saying it, something that'll just stick with people a little more than, you know, maybe reading the news or avoiding the news about something that's difficult for them. <clears throat> and then maybe a little more complexity, like talking about things like sovereignty and who owns the land, um, you know, putting them into a poem about my favorite things that I see on I-94 is very different from, you know, just telling people, here's the boundaries of this reservation and the DNR uses it for this. And there's a right of way here and there's a right of way there. But writing about all the giant uh, utility towers on along 94 and comparing it to the maps that our great grandparents and great great grandparents knew um, those same trails, you know, that's that's something maybe people will put that into their thinking about Minnesota and how it's mapped by our people's. Um, our Dakota and Ojibwe peoples and others, and how those things are still meaningful to us. I think, um, you know, when you talk about the bison, many people didn't know or don't know that um, there was a conscious effort to to destroy the bison um, here in North America. So uh, a, gen a genocidal tactic, right, to harm Indigenous people, to get us to colonize and and adapt. So I think, you know, those are important things that we don't see in our history books. So I appreciate it when um, there's an opportunity to share some of those stories. Yeah. And just to think about how people are nervous and about environmental apocalypse. And I always take a moment to try to help people understand that there's a huge group of people who've already been through this. Our major species disappeared, our land utterly altered, our ways of being able to practice our religions and our spirituality shifted because of those creatures being hunted to extinction or being decimated. Um, so those things are, the, we've been there and, you know, we, if anybody knows about survival, it's us and about how to relate and recover and return things and, and change our relationship with those animals and beings and places. I think that's, that's really, I mean, you nailed it, Rebecca. It's just like right there. Um, that's where we do it. And, you know, I mean, and for me, it's personal. I grew up on the plains and my great grandfather and his great grandfather were bison hunters. That's what, how they lived, you know? I'm, I know, you know, on top of having really native people are impacted uh, I think more severely by climate change issues. But I also think, you know, many of our communities are on the forefront of doing what we can to reduce our carbon footprint, to restore our lands. You know, here at SMSC, we restore our prairies. We've been restoring oak savannas. Um, in a, a month or so here, we're getting ready to reintroduce bison um, back on our lands here in Shakopee. So, you know, it, it's really exciting to see you know, the progress of like the prairie restoration and the birds and the bees and the animals that come back, you know, when you provide them their their safe natural habitat. Um, it's been really fun to watch. So thank you for, you know, writing about those those issues and and sharing with the world kind of some of the things that go on. Yeah. And I think, I mean, people think it's impossible to change. Um, but, you know, little things like making a home for those Indigenous pollinators, these native pollinators, is huge. My sister Angie, she's a physician at the Indian Health Board in, in um, Minneapolis. She is making gardens all over the place. And this year, the state bee, which is an endangered bee, the rusty sided bumblebee, is in her gardens, like in a couple of years. So um, those things I take as, you know, signs that if little, if little steps are taken, the bigger steps will come. So yeah. what you're doing is amazing. It's the next step. Yeah, I'm excited to see kind of what returning a capstone species to, you know, those restored prairies will will do. So yeah. um, stay tuned. We'll hopefully know soon. Um, so in addition to being a writer, you're also an editor and curator. You mm -hmm. co-edited edited the Minnesota Native American Live series, uh, which was wonderful, by the way. 
uh, the, their books for young people about notable Native people in our state. Um, what is that process like? Well, you know, this was our first go at it, but I have edited, you know, most of my adult life. I've worked with uh, writers on their projects, and um, I I think it was really fun, first of all, because it was giving people who write in the format for students a chance to tell a story that really mattered to them. Um, and, you know, it was great to find the writers that came forward because we did a public call, uh, some who had never published anything before and some who had been self-publishing their own series like Katie Ferris um, to to create a uh, materials that his children and grandchildren could see and other people in their classrooms about, you know, the the history and the lives of Native people in Minnesota. And one of our, our books was about Peggy Flanagan, though. So there's two Dakota subjects and two Ojibwe subjects. And Peggy, of course, is not a historical figure in, in entirety. She's still our current lieutenant governor. But it was great to be able to show people that, too. It's like not just about historical people. We're present and we're part of the future. I think it's so powerful to have, you know, those books in our schools for our Native kids to see themselves reflected, you know, in a very modern way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as um, you know, we have the Understand Native Minnesota campaign and really trying to do what we can to change the narrative and, and make people understand that we are still here, right, as modern, uh, real day people um, doing modern things. Uh, and speaking of Understand Native Minnesota, um, you recently spoke at our Educator Academy um, and offered Minnesota teachers and administrators. Um, what advice do you have uh, to our educators who want to better represent Native history, culture, and civics in our classrooms? I always start with two things, and one is to start using the present tense. Um, Native people are, not long ago Native people or Dakota people did or Ojibwe people did this or that, but just get yourself to always use the present tense. We are always here. We weren't here. And then just our bones discovered, you know, we continue. And, um, and then, you know, also to think again, to be able to say, you know, the future, you know, this is one of the things Dakota people are working on for their future is returning bison. Um, you know, that just when they talk to the students just not being only historical uh who's working in math and sciences what are some of the you know ways that we're part of every part of life in minnesota and in the world i think those are really important things and then the second thing i do is i ask people to say native american peoples or indigenous cultures because you know, they might enjoy the Native American culture, but I'm like, which one of it is? You know, which one are you talking about? There are hundreds of us. And although we're neighbors, Ojibwe and Dakota people are very different with very different ways of you know being in the world. And so I think um, it's really it's really a big step to be able to say, you know, cultures and then use that name, use the name of the people you're talking about. Are you talking about Dakota people? Are you talking about Ho Chung people, who are you talking about? And if you don't know, find out. It's not hard to get that information. So I think it's really important um, to be specific. Uh, so those are the two things I start with. And then I ask people to think about using the arts as a way of teaching in every across the curriculum, if you can, because it's an open access point. It's a point by which we want ourselves known. We love our arts. We treasure our artists and um we want that to be something we're known for also it's a place that we are excelling this past week two native artists won macarthur foundation genius awards and one of them is a minnesota artist diani whitehawk and i mean i couldn't be happier for them and also for the kids who get to grow up knowing that these are some of the best artists in the united states that's an, a wonderful thing if you are interested in discovering Native authors like Hyde, I encourage you to visit Birchbark Books in Minneapolis. Owned by Hyde's sister, Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist and poet Louise Erdrich, this bookstore is focused on Indigenous books, arts, and gifts. You can also find Hyde's poetry at the store and on their website, birchbarkbooks.com. Now, back to our episode. 
It is wonderful to see our our people being recognized for their accomplishments, especially in the arts. I feel like Native people have so many beautiful gifts to share, and it's been fun to see, you know, all the Native fashion designers and um, different things that are becoming more mainstream now. So, so in addition to being an author, um, you're also a curator. So when you talk a little bit about the arts, like, can you tell us maybe some of the the things you've curated and maybe how we could incorporate those into um, teaching or bring them into the classroom? Yeah, I'm, I have became a curator in sort of an odd way. I was a college professor. I was tenured. I had worked for about 20 years teaching college English and creative writing with Native studies um, where I could. And I decided that I wanted to work in community more. There weren't that many Native students, very few, and no Native colleagues for me in my institution. I had begun to think I wanted to teach in a different way where I'd be teaching in community. And I made the decision and I walked into the um, gallery at Ancient Traders in Minneapolis where the All My Relations program used to be. And Shirley Stone, the curator, was there. And there was a great event. And as I was leaving, she said, oh, I want to talk to you. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. And I said, but this has been a heck of a day. I've got to go. And she said, oh, what happened? I said, well, I decided to quit my job. And she goes, that's what I want to talk to you about. Would you want like my job? Then <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> and just like that. Um, so I, before I'd even gotten home, I was driving home from work. I knew what I was going to do next, and I was really excited about it. I, I mean, I wanted to be on Franklin Avenue, and I wanted to work with the artists who I'd admired and figure out ways to bring that program um, into something like it is now, something like I'd envisioned um, with its own gallery at the Native American Community Development Institute. So that's kind of how the story of that went. And since then, it's been an incredible journey and just a lot of joy. And I've seen people learn so much from visiting an art gallery, from talking to an artist. Do you have a specific um, like style or, you know, whether it's like painting or beading or fashion or, you know, that you favor? I'm super open to everything. I really am. Uh, I um, have a desire to see excellence, you know, like what I think of as somebody who's really applied themselves to their work, who's really got their own style, their own plan, that they have accomplished something. And I had, a, you know, enough of an arts training to know when somebody has really worked their way through um, their subject and their technique and so forth. So I really, I'm a little bit more drawn to to the artists that are able to do that work. But I, you know, I have artists that I love and in every style, every medium. And yes, I like fashion too, but um, <laughs> I, I, it hasn't been an area that I have been able to present that often. Uh, most recently, I was working with uh, Indigenous literary texts from the 1700s to contemporary um, times and combining that with uh, uh, contemporary and uh, art throughout the U.S. history to create a 150 item show in Amherst, Massachusetts. So, I mean, I really, I do a lot of different things with my curatorial opportunities. Do you, would you have some artists that um, you think folks here in Minnesota that are listening to the podcast uh, would be interested in? Sure. You know, I mentioned Diani Whitehawk. Um, one of the things about Diani's work is it's very design oriented. It uh, forwards the abstractions that existed here before any of the the artists of the 20th century started saying they were, you know, making abstractions. Uh, and it could be a really great math uh, tool, I think, if people looked at the math of, and the geometry and just the, the way that uh, Diani's work is put together, I think they could learn a lot about that. But Diani... Um, the late Jim Denemy, who was one of my dearest friends, uh, his narratives that he created in his canvases, stories of Minnesota history, local history, um, you know, things that we think about, um, starting with Indian gaming was one of uh, the first uh, series of paintings that I looked at with him, you know, questioning, you know, what does what will become of this? You know, how will it work for us? Uh, and just so many things are in his canvases. And there's a huge show of his up at the Mia right now. 
and uh, it'll be there till January, I believe. So there's a chance in 2023 to see this amazing show. And then there's other resources that have a lot of his work. Uh, boy, I could just go on and on about this. Uh, Kate Bean, Dakota, is um, the, uh, the directs the M, the museum in St. Paul, the Minnesota Museum of Art. And we are really there with the art in Minnesota. You know, there's great galleries in Bemidji, Duluth. So you can see artists everywhere and you can make sure that um, your students have some access to those artists. Uh, and, you know, I think there's also can, historical artists that you can learn a lot from. Robert DeJarly is one. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of other artists that are, that are, uh, have historical families. There's two, Patrick DeJarly as well. Um, Carl Gobway is an ethno-historical Ojibwe painter that has been painting for almost 60 years, I think, and painting o Ojibwe history and culture and presence. Uh, Jonathan Thunder is one of my favorite artists. I have, I think I have one of his t-shirts on today. And uh, Jonathan is both an animator and a painter, uh, of Red Lake Nation, uh, has done a lot with Ojibwe language teaching. So you can find sometimes uh, animated videos with Jonathan's work that also incorporated Ojibwe language in free resources. Uh, and he's also done children's books. So you can see that. Uh, my gosh, I feel like I'm going to leave some good friend out if I, if I don't stop soon. I tried to make it equally Dakota and Ojibwe. Oh, and then there's musical artists. We have so many great musical artists. And after the um, symposium that you had for educators, a woman came up and said, oh, it was interesting, but I teach music, so it doesn't apply to me. And I said, oh, here's the musicians you want to look up. You know, we have a national heritage artist who's Dakota, Brian Akipa, um, in our larger uh, Dakota communities. And, uh, you know, just so many composers and, uh, you know, contemporary musicians. And I just, you know, not to mention all of our powwow drums and ladies hand drum singers. So I think that People just don't know it's out there. And once you let them know, like non-native people might not know. And, you know, suddenly they're like, oh, I found all these resources. And of course, there's a lot at the Humanities Center, too. They have a lot of resources so that you can hear people's, you know, hear them talking about their own artistic work. You know, we're constantly trying to share resources because people are, you know, they don't know how to vet them. So, you know, talking to Native people or educators or, you know, like folks like you that have a very long list of resources is definitely helpful um, as we do this work uh, under the Understand Native Minnesota campaign. And I think, too, you know, you talked about using Deanne Whitehawk's work for geometry or math um, with the, the new standards in place. You know, teachers are looking for resources. And I think we, you know, have to encourage some creativity in how they incorporate Native subject matter mm -hmm. into the different subjects. And you just um, shared some really great examples and ideas. So thank you for that. As a teacher, um, you know, you get to probably be around a ton of um, bright students. And, you know, do you do you learn from them as much as you think they learn from you? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I think I think that students have inspired me as much as anything else. You know, a, a great book writer, uh, you know, a great author maybe inspires me less than somebody struggling with a really important story to themselves that they might want to tell or something really important they want to express through poetry or visual art. So, um, yeah, I have learned a lot from my students. I've learned uh, to be aware of people's struggles. Uh, I first worked with a lot of students who were um, moms going back to college and suddenly was aware of, you know, how to parent and work and how hard that is and how important it is to people to get a degree, not just to get a better job, but just to understand the world. And I really respected that, that people would be like, you know, I started my family early, but I want to have that that education so I understand what's going on around me and that I feel powerful enough to address things. You know, I think that helps. I'm not saying that people who don't get a formal education can't do that. I'm just saying for some people, it's a huge motivating factor. 
And so I learned that in Minnesota in the 90s, 2000s. And then when I started working outside formal education, I learned how important it was for people's needs to be met. You know, when somebody comes to you in a community setting, do you have food for them? Um, do they know how they're getting to and from a, a place where you might be teaching them? Uh, for a while, I was working with youth and I gave them time at the end of each session to figure out where they were staying because some of them were staying with one another. They weren't staying in their parents' homes. And I just learned, you know, that meet the person where they come because you have no idea what they've done that day or what they have to do that day. And I think that's something people can really learn about every student. They see, you know, that student that comes into your room is bringing with them how, you know, everything that happened to them that day. And I'm not saying teachers don't know that. I think that they, you know, have to advocate for that being able to meet those needs. And I think that's actually probably one of the hardest things to to see is that, you know, people really need a lot more than a door and a lesson. They need, you know, basic needs met. And, you know, to always think around that and figure out creatively, like you said, how are we going to work around these things? How are we going to make sure people have what they need? Yeah. So I think I, I learned that a lot. Um, I, I mean, I learned a lot from my students. Do you have like a favorite age group that you like to interact with? Uh, well, you know, I've been a college teacher most of my life and I still like young uh, working with young adults, but uh I'm happy to work with anybody of any age. I've worked with people 30 years older than me, uh, although that's going to get harder. <laughs> um, I've worked with people uh, who are, um, you know, in junior high and high school. I think that I'm better working on writing with older students, uh, you know, people who are in high school through through college and beyond. Uh, but with visual art, it's really fun to see what happens with younger kids because they nobody's told them they're not creative yet. Um, nobody's told them they can't, you know, draw. Um, somebody told Jim Denemy he couldn't draw once. So <laughs> and look what he did. <laughs> so, you know, I, you can't you can't tell that about anybody. I can never tell if somebody's going to uh, improve because it's really about their motivation and their willingness to like try different techniques. So I think that the younger the kid is when they experience a visual art curriculum that allows them to look and see what an artist has done and then try to do it for themselves. I think that's the big key. You know, don't tell them here's your cutout cookie, you know, cookie cutter exercise and you color it in, you know, say, what is, what does a cookie look like? Show me with these tools and look at a cookie and try and recreate it with these tools. I think that's that's where they find their own creati creativity is when they're told that they can do it. Well, speaking of finding creativity, um, what can you share with us? Maybe what you're working on or what's up next for you? Yeah, um, I am doing two things <laughs> at least, which is not a lot for me. I usually do a lot of things at once. Um, I am going to teach at the loft in a year-long program uh, in poetry so i'll work with people working on their first books or a book manuscript in poetry all year at the loft literary center it's but it's a distance program it's all online so anybody can join and while i'm doing that i'm hoping to finish a book that i've been working on that has a little bit about genealogy in it. Not so much my family's genealogy. I knew, you know, my family kind of have to. Native people know who their families are. Um, but what I didn't know was the kind of way that genealogy was kept and, you know, the ways people had to conform in, in order to get their names on records, both Native people, white people, people who were enslaved or in servanthood when they came to what became the United States. So I've been I've been looking at that, studying that, um, looking at how people moved across the continent, where they stayed, um, you know, the religious movements that pushed white people across the continent and how that resulted in a lot of the genealogy we have now. So there's like, so it's kind of fascinating to me. I don't know how it's going to become meaningful. I never know. If I went into it knowing where I was going, I would be bored. So <laughs> I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> I let it come. That sounds amazing. I love um, the genealogy stuff. I know, you know, my name is 
Crooks, uh, Rebecca Crooks. And um, I was told that my great great grandfather was a scout for the General George Crook. So when they started recording names, um, he got recorded as George Crooks because he was Crooks's scout. So um, yeah, I find all that stuff fascinating, especially, you know, for us Indigenous people who um, oftentimes were were changed, our names were changed, or, you know, we were given surnames that didn't exist uh, at the time. So, well, I look forward to um, seeing uh, what you what you produced there. Thank you. Um, Looking forward to it, too, since I don't know yet. But it sounds like a fun project. Um, you know, I, I think just wrapping up here, uh, you know, you you obviously are a very creative person, um, but sometimes for a lot of people that can feel a little intimidating. Do you have any suggestions for a way people can infuse more creativity in their everyday life? That's a really good question. I love that because, you know, I, like I said, I don't believe that people aren't creative. I think they have been told they're not or they they don't have a big product. You can be creative without having a product. And one of my favorite projects I ever worked on was my Indigenous Foods book. I wrote a, a book called Original Local about foods of the Native peoples of the upper Midwest. And in doing that, I realized how creative making food is and thinking about food and making it beautiful. So I think, you know, people can start with making their own food. It just is such a wonderful experience. It's good for you. It's good for your family. Um, but it's also just lets you use beautiful things, you know, fruits, vegetables, um, and just like, just have fun with it. You know, and I, I think uh, try something that you've never tried before. Don't be intimidated by the videos. Don't even look at the videos. <laughs> just learn to relate to the food and, and cook and try try indigenous ingredients first. That's funny. I have, you know, friends that are chefs, are especially our native chefs and their yeah. Instagram pages and all the beautiful things. Like I never really thought about it as art until you just um kind of made my mind go that way. I'm like, yeah, they're creating art with food. Yeah, it's creative. It's a creative urge. It's a loving urge. It's the same thing that visual artists, poets, writers that we and musicians do in making something from nothing and making it your own and then giving it to someone else. That's the, uh, the part of it that's huge. You got to give it to someone else. Amazing. Well, hi, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, wonderful conversation and um, I'm sure you've got lots of things to get back to, but just um, are very grateful that you shared your time and insight with us this afternoon. Thank you for joining me for the Native Minnesota podcast. For more episodes, please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can also visit our website, understandnativemn.org, to learn more about our campaign's work to improve the Native narrative in Minnesota's public schools.